Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Hi, my name is Cynthia, and I'm a child of God, and I'm here to share with you the gospel, which is the good news. Um, I know I've been away for a while, and um, I just chalk it to, um, you know, Satan wants to silence the watchers. Satan doesn't want the gospel getting out there, and he will do anything and throw obstacles our way to keep us from sharing the truth, which is that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. We are living in the last days, and um, we're under attack. Christians are under attack um, all over. We are struggling. But we know that God is always with us. So for me, I lost my vehicle. I live out in the country on a lake. Um, I work about 15 miles, 20 miles from where I live and I'm a nurse um, so I've been working like I just did three 16-hour shifts in a row and because I don't have transportation I just slept in the basement um, in between shifts um, until I had a ride home again and then I got called for jury duty and it's just been one thing after another but I'm very happy to be back to um, share with you the good news which is that Jesus is coming, and he's coming soon, and we don't have much longer here. So we're going to look at the book of Revelation, and we're going to start in this video with chapters 1 through 4. Um, now, I am sharing with you the commentary from the Jack Van Imp Prophecy Bible, which is amazing, and I want to get that out there right away. I don't do a lot of links and credit giving and things like that um, because... All scripture comes from God. And that's why you won't see a lot of that. I do share um, many links and um, in my commentary, um, or what is it, the community tab. So please check those out. Um, I share a lot of the um, what the other watchmen are saying. Watchman River, God a Minute, um, Uptime Prophecy, Brother Chooch from TOL End Times, Tyler from Generation, Generation, and I always get this wrong, but Generation 2434, I think that might be right, but I share those links so that you can also check out what the other um, watchmen that I, um, Dr. Barry Ah, I, I know I'm going to miss people, but check out the common, um, my community tab, um, I share quite a bit there, and um, the first thing before we get into the book of Revelation, I want to talk to you about the good news. And that is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That's John 3.16. And John 3.16 is without a doubt the best known Bible passage. It has brought comfort and hope to millions perhaps billions of people, and contains an important message for you today. At its core, this verse tells us about the salvation, the means by which God res rescues um, the perishing and gives everlasting life to all who believe its message. For God, the message of salvation begins with God. You and I might be tempted to look at ourselves and say, what have I done? Or what can I do? But God wants to draw our attention to what he has done for us. So loved. What could move an all-powerful God to take an interest in what happens to you and me? Here we discover a wonderful thing about God. He loves us. Even though we have rebelled against our creator, his love has, pro has provided the way of salvation the world. God's love extends to everyone. No one is too young or too old, too rich or too poor, 
too exceptional or too ordinary to receive his love. It reaches around the globe to find you right where you are that he gave. Giving gifts is a natural expression of love. While our giving is always limited by our resources, God is able to give us blessings of infinite and never-ending value. His only begotten Son. Here we find the first of two gifts mentioned in this verse. Jesus, the eternal Son of God, came to earth and was born as a baby. He was given the name Jesus, which means the Lord is salvation. His miraculous arrival fulfilled many, many ancient prophecies, one of which says, Unto us a son is given, who will be called Mighty God, and bring forth a kingdom characterized by justice and righteousness. Isaiah 9, 6-7 To enter God's holy kingdom, we must be perfectly righteous. And that's a problem. Because God knows our sinful hearts and has declared that there is none righteous. No, not one. Romans 3.10 God's holiness demands that a price be paid for sin. That is why God gave his son to pay the price on our behalf. When Jesus laid down his life on the cross, bearing God's punishment for our sin, he opened the way for us to be made righteous. He then rose from the dead on the third day, proving that God was pleased with his sacrifice. That whosoever God's gift of salvation through Jesus Christ is offered to everyone, regardless of who we are or what we have done. Jesus has promised to receive us. Him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. John 6:37. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, 9. And by the way, I love the book of 2 Peter. Um, just throwing that out there. If you're looking for a great book to read that's sometimes overlooked, read, read the smaller books. Read 2 Peter. Read Jude. Um, but believeth in him. Believeth means two things here. First, we must believe what the Bible says about Jesus. <clears throat> this means acknowledging who he is and what he has done. Hebrews eleven six. But it's deeper than just accepting facts about him. The belief spoken of here also implies total trust. To receive salvation, we must lay aside any thoughts of our own worthiness and come to him just as we are. When we rest our souls completely on his grace, trusting him alone for salvation, our sins are washed away and we are clothed in his righteousness, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Titus 3, 5, another great book. By grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. And many people have heard um, that verse. Read all of Ephesians. Don't just take um, a Bible verse from here or there. Um, read the books. You would be amazed at the things that you will read in the Bible. It, the Bible is the most amazing book ever. Um, but let's continue. Should not perish. The Bible says we are born in sin, and if we reject God's forgiveness, we will also die in sin, separated from God forever. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. John three thirty six. I trust you will turn to God so you do not perish, but have everlasting life. Everlasting life is the second greatest gift of God mentioned in John 3.16, and includes more than you might realize. Not only does God bless those who trust in Jesus with never-ending joys in his presence for all eternity, but he also fills their earthly lives with many wonderful blessings. 
He forgives their sins and makes them brand new in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1, 7 and 2. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He adopts them as his children and promises them an, inherit an inheritance in his kingdom. Romans 8, 15. And 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4. He sends his spirit to dwell in them, giving them the ability to live a life that is pleasing to him. Acts 2.38 and Galatians 5.16. He promises to be with them through every difficulty of life, never leaving them and never letting them go. Romans 8.28, John 10.27-28. through 28. So how can you have everlasting life? When you receive God's Son, you receive everlasting life. It's as simple as that. You can't have one without the other. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. 1 John 5, 12. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. John 1, 12. Will you receive him today? Carefully think about the scriptures and read the scripture verses. Then talk to God in your own words, confessing to him that you are a sinner in need of salvation. Thank him for sending Jesus to take the punishment your sins deserve. Put your total trust in what he has done for you and ask him to save you, and he will. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Acts 16, 31. And this also starts you out with prayer and a relationship with God. And believe me, you want that relationship with God. You are, we are all seeking after something. And that something is God. Nothing can fill that void. We were created as companions to God, to worship God. And we've all gone astray. And that hole will never be filled, fulfilled by anything that the world has to offer. It can only be filled by Jesus Christ. Trust in him today. The truth is, looking at this world around us, we are living in amazing times. Bible prophecy is being fulfilled right before our very eyes. There's so much that we can't cover it all. And we're looking at Israel because, well, let's be honest, we were told to watch Israel. Um, the war that's happening in Israel, um, we're calling it the Jubilee War because it is a Jubilee year. Um, it, it's it's taking off to set up so many future um, events, and we're gonna see we're seeing this happening today, um, along with the the weather, the so-called climate change, the falling away from the faith the pagan worship that is off the charts today. People are literally worshiping Baal, um, AI, technology. The world around us is primed and ready for the tribulation to begin at any moment. The cashless society, the droughts, the famines, the food shortages, it's all leading to the one world government, one world religion, the mark of the beast. We're all we're, That's where we're going. Um, and because I believe that we're leaving soon, we are going to be raptured. I don't know how long these videos from any of the watchmen, myself, or any of the other watchmen, um, or the Bible studies, I don't know how long these videos will even be here. But I, I, I truly believe that if you're left behind and you do not leave with us in the rapture to go with the Lord and to escape these things that are about to come on the world, I truly believe... Um, the book of Revelation is going to be a guidepost for many, many people who are searching for the truth when their Christian loved ones disappear. And so that's why I'm going back to the book of Revelation. And I think it's relevant today, and it's going to be extremely relevant in the future. Um, chapters 1 through 4 deal with the church and that's us and we're leaving and I want to start with the church because that's the age that we're living in right now we're living in an age of grace but the church is going to be gone soon the restrainer is going to stop restraining and 
the things that are coming on this world is going to be terrifying. The book of Revelation is the culmination of Bible prophecy. The point at which all the prophecies of the ages converge and find their ultimate fulfillment. We're going to go through the whole book of Revelation, but we're going to start with 1 through 4, and my next video will probably be 5 through 10, um, until we get to the end. <sighs> but Revelation discloses the future of the Jew, Gentile, and the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Within its pages are specific details concerning the Savior's return, the establishment of his millennial kingdom, and finally, the eternal state of both the saved and the lost. The word revelation comes from the Greek um, word apocalypsis, meaning an uncovering or unveiling. For this reason, the book of Revelation is also known as the apocalypse. In either case, the definition reflects the fact that God has made known to mankind those eternal supernatural truths and realities which man on his own could never realize or discover. Our, we could never have made this. I mean, it is absolutely written by God through the prophet John. The book of Revelation is the final work of the New Testament and the revelation of Jesus Christ, which details world history from the time of John, the early church age, to eternity. It constitutes God's last special revelation to mankind this side of heaven. Simply stated, Bible prophecy and revelation are history written in advance. They form God's description of future facts and events. Such prophecy is completely trustworthy because God is omniscient. He knows all things, whether they be actual or merely possible, and he knows them perfectly from all eternity. Acts 15, 18 states, Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Thus, the Almighty is able to fully and accurately describe the future in advance of its actual occurrence. Current international events reflect exactly the conditions and happenings predicted throughout the Bible for the last days of this age. Yet comparatively, um, comparatively little prophetic teaching and preaching are currently taking place. This is probably due to the fact that this field of endeavor involves a great amount of research and study. See 2 Timothy 2.15 Millions more prefer not to have prophecy explained to them because they would rather live by the world's standards and dictates. As individuals who are seeking satisfaction and rewards in this life, they are obviously not anxiously anticipating Christ's return. You will can find yourself arguing endlessly with um, people who don't believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, who don't, who, who say Jesus is only coming one time, who say that there's going to be, I mean, you're going to find a lot of different um, opinions, but go to the Bible and the word because the word is clear. It's very clear. I, I think that sometimes some of the people who are dead set against a pre-tribulation rapture or the Christ, Christ return and are even denying that we're in the last days, I believe it's because they've fallen in love with the things of this world and they're not ready to let it go. But we are going home soon, as Jesus has um, promised. He said he would come back again, and he's coming back very soon. And we, the church, will be going to meet with him for the marriage of the Lamb. It's going to be amazing, but it's going to be terrible for those who are left behind. And I don't argue on my channel. If you disagree and you post your other thoughts um, or opinions, they'll just be deleted. Um, this is my channel. And if you want to um, share false doctrine, you can go do it on your own channel. I don't allow it on mine. Just a disclosure for you. Um, but as we walk through the book of Revelation together, remember that, remember that this special message has been given to reveal 
God's truth, not conceal it, and to clarify God's eternal purpose, not mystify it. I have not attempted to present an elaborate outline or engage in the use of heavy theological terminology. My goal is simplicity through a verse-by-verse analysis. I trust that as a result, each reader will gain a clear understanding of the blessed truths the book of Revelation contains. This work was prepared to alert millions to the fact that Jesus is coming soon, perhaps today. Um, So Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. We begin our study by immediately recognizing that the noun is revelation, singular, not revelations, plural. The term comes from the Greek word apocalypsis and means an unveiling or uncovering. It is often used in the epistles as um, as a manifestation, Romans 8.19, a coming, 1 Corinthians 1.7, a revealing, 2 Thessalonians 1.7, and an appearing, 1 Peter 1.7. The book of Revelation then concerns the unveiling or appearance of our precious Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not the unfolding of the story of St. John the Divine or even prophetic truth, but rather the message of the appearing of Christ. This appearing takes place at the rapture, chapter 4, verse 1, which is why I started that out. Um, That was the verse I shared with you at the very beginning of my video as well as at the hour of his return to earth, when every eye shall see him, chapter 1, verse 7. Secondly, we see that this revelation was given to Jesus Christ, as is everything. For Jesus said, all things are delivered unto me of my Father, Matthew 11, 27. They are presented unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. The term shortly in the original means rapidity rapidity of action. (coughs) Um, Once there is a beginning, this certainly pictures the present hour when signs pointing to his return are beginning to appear with alarming frequency. These truths then are sent (coughs) and signified by Christ's angel onto John, the the writer of this book, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. (coughs) Notice that the first four letters of the word signified spell sign. Why? The book of Revelation is a study of signs. There is the sign of the Holy Spirit presented as seven spirits. Verse 4 and the sign of the seven golden candlesticks and the seven stars in verse 20. Thus, through signs, we come to an understanding (coughs) of this gloriously revealed portion of the scripture. Verse 2. John, bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Well, this statement is self-explanatory. So let's move on to verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Verse 3 proves that the apocalypse is not some deep, mysterious, confusing book. God would not be an omniscient, all-knowing God if he promised a special blessing to those who read, hear, and keep what they read and hear. If they were unable to comprehend the truth, 
No, the book of Revelation is understandable and fills the heart with joy once one sees its glorious message concerning, um, concerning the Savior. One reason that readers and hearers are to keep that which they have heard is because the time of Christ's return is at hand. <sighs> the words at hand means imminent. Near and imminent are not synonymous. Imminent means impending. Hence the events, the event could happen immediately or within 10 minutes, 10 months, or even 10 years. Imminence is always the meaning of at hand when speaking about the return of the Lord. For example, Romans 13, 12 says, the night is far spent, the day is at hand, imminent. Philippians 4, 5, Philippians 4, 5 declares, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. And 1 Peter 4, 7 says, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Thus, the next event on God's calendar, the return of Christ for his church, may happen momentarily. That is why we, as Christians, should keep our eyes fixed heavenward, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Titus 2.13 Um you know, when you're like out there commenting and you're trying to share the word of God or and you find yourself caught up in an argument about the rapture or about the existence of God, I, there's so many mockers and scoffers out there today that they, they just laugh at you and say, where is your proof? You know, the best thing that I've found to do is to tell people I'm... Uh, I'm not obligated to do your research for you. I'm obligated to share the gospel with you. You're not, you know, you're not obligated to believe, but I'm obligated to tell you. And you just share the gospel. And then you know what you do? I mean, if you want to wait for a few comments and see if there's questions. Um, but when you're dealing with the real mockers and scoffers who will not, nothing you tell them is going to change their minds. I, I just want to throw this tip out to you. Um, wash your hands of it. Shake off the dust off your boots and move on. You just tell them. You're not obligated to believe, but I'm obligated to tell you. You share the gospel. You tell them about Jesus. You post the um, the gospel scriptures of salvation. And then you turn off those notifications because you can beat yourself. Um, you can, you're, you're planting seeds. And when we do, when the rapture does happen, those seeds, they're going to take root. They will remember what you said. And if they still continue to choose to reject Jesus, which some of them, you'll never get through to them because they've already made that choice. Um, but you've done your part and your hands are clean. I, I just want to say that I've been meaning to um, mention um, that little tip to, to, to you guys, my family, my church, um, just to help you out there because it, we know it's been rough. I know it's been rough. So you share the gospel and you move on if that's what you have to do. You'll never get through to them, um, but you've planted the seeds. God, It's God who's going to make those seeds grow. <sighs> All right, so let's move on now. Um, verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. John um, now focuses his attention on seven local churches located in a land area called Asia. This is not Asia. <coughs> Sorry, I'm still getting over my allergies, but I'm doing much better. Um, but this is not Asia um, as we know it today. Um, but probably a portion of Turkey. Only seven churches are mentioned, although there were undoubtedly more in existence. Seven is God's number of perfection. The number also pictures seven different sets of conditions reflecting the history of God's people through the church age. God's salutation found in 19 of the 27 books of the New Testament um, is presented here as well. Grace be unto you and peace 
it is not peace and grace, but grace and peace. Because this is God's program for sinners. They cannot have peace until he has shown them his lovely grace. God must show his unmerited favor and love called grace before one can experience peace. This grace is shown through the sacrifice of Calvary and is freely bestowed upon um, all who believe and receive Christ. For by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Um, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Titus 2, 11. When grace has done its job, peace follows. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 1. This peace was made through the blood of his cross. Um, Colossians 1, 20. Thus, Romans 15, 13 states, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Only Jesus can give this peace. An unsaved psychiatrist is unable to do the job. Psychiatrists need the same peace that they strive to give. Thus, we must turn our problems over to the Son of God. We also find that the message of grace and peace is from the entire Trinity. First, the Father, which is, which was, and which is to come. Then from the seven spirits, which are before the throne, a designation of the blessed Holy Spirit in all of his holiness, for seven means perfection. Verse 5, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. The question is often asked, Why is Christ the first begotten from the dead when Lazarus and others were raised first? And the answer is simple. Others were raised to life, but they died again. They were raised from physical death to physical life, only to eventually die a second time. Jesus Christ was raised from dead to immortality. Immorality. Never to die again. He is the first to have been resurrected with a new, never dying body. This is why Christ should be the first that should rise from the dead. Acts 26, 23. And why he only hath immortality. 1 Timothy 6, 16. Five times Christ is called the first begotten or the firstborn from the dead. Another five times he is also called the only begotten. The term only begotten refers to his incarnation whereas first begotten or or firstborn refers to his resurrection. For instance, he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, Hebrews 1, 6. Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, Colossians 1, 15. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have um, preeminence. Colossians 1.18. Romans 8.29 declares, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Think these verses through carefully so that no cultist can trip you up on the uh, on the terms first begotten and firstborn in his attempts to make the eternal Christ have a beginning no praise God Christ is from <coughs> is from Christ is from of old from everlasting Micah 5 2 yeah he is one with the everlasting father Isaiah 9 6 Um, The Lord Jesus Christ is also called the Prince of the Kings of the Earth. This, of course, refers to the future. When the Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9, 6, returns to the earth as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 
<coughs> Revelation 19, 16, I'm sorry. Um, um, this glorious, glorious event will be fulf the fulfillment of Psalm 2, 6, which states, I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. At that time, the Lord Jesus shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river onto the ends of the earth. Psalm 72, 8, verse 6. And he hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Verse 5 and 6 contains three glorious statements concerning Christ's work on our behalf. He loves us. He washes us from our sins in his own blood. And he hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. The order is beautiful. Let's examine it in detail. First, the Lord Jesus had to love us in order to wash us and make us kings and priests. However, it is even more thrilling when one sees that his love is in the present tense, meaning that he continues loving those he has washed. This is why John 13, 1 triumphantly declares Jesus, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Can you understand such love? Oh, that you may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. Ephesians 3, 18 and 19. This love is forever. That is why Paul declared in Romans 8:37 through 39, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The love which Jesus Christ has bestowed upon each born-again believer should manifest itself in daily living. For he said to his own, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, and that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love for one to another. John 13, 34 and 35. This love for you and me brought Christ from heaven's glory to the cruel cross of Golgotha's, Hall, um, Golgotha's Hill. Um, love made him shed his blood for the remission of our sins. Secondly, he washed us. Some do not like the teaching about the blood. They want to earn heaven by their own meritous works. However, being whitewashed is not the same thing as being washed white. There is a vast difference. It is not less toil that solves the difficulty. It is no toil. Listen to God. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration. Titus 3, 5. When one trusts in the merits of Christ's shed blood, his sins are gone. Um, as far as the east from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Psalms 103, 12. Isaiah 38, 17 declares, Thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. God says, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions <clears throat> and as a cloud thy sins. Isaiah 44, 22. Yes, he has cast all our sins into the depth of the sea. Micah 7, 19. Come to Jesus and he will lift all your load. And here's proof. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believes in him shall receive remission of sins. Acts 10, 43. It matters not how far astray the wayward son or daughter has gone. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanseth us from all sin. 1 John 1, 7. Thirdly, because of his love and the washing of regeneration, Christ is able to make us kings and priests unto God and his Father. Priest is the title of every believer. 
It is also the reason one does not need a minister to help him get closer to God. If you have been born again, you are a priest in the eyes of the Almighty. You can bring your own petitions to God. One is not heard any more rapidly because he has been ordained by men, for all born-again believers are on the same level. All members of a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, that we should show forth the praises of him who hath called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. 1 Peter 2, 9. What a calling. Thank you, Jesus. John adds to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Ah, this verse announces the Lord's return to earth. Notice that every eye sees him. That is why this great event is described as the revealing or revelation of Christ and occurs when he comes as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Revelation 19, 11 through 16. Thus, our text is actually a preview of what will happen when he returns with his saints in chapter 19. And isn't it thrilling to know that when the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, Matthew 24, 27, every eye will witness the spectacular the spectacle of the ages. Notice also that the Israelites, a special group, will observe this monumentous event, for they shall look upon him whom they have pierced. Zechariah 12.10 Furthermore, <laughs> when he comes in power and great glory to smite the nations, all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. This is because he comes for judgment and none will escape. As John envisions the hour when the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints, Jude 14, he victoriously cries, Amen, Amen. The Greek for even so is Amen. And Amen is the Hebrew for even so. John is literally shouting the praise or praises of God in two languages as he says, Amen and Amen. He is coming. Verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. This text speaks of the eternal Christ. Alpha and Omega are the beginning and the ending letters of the Greek alphabet. Christ is saying, I am the beginning and the ending of all things. He uses the title I am which is a verb indicating being, but not becoming. He always was. He was before all things and created all things. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John 1 verse 3. For by him were all things created that are in the heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, or principalities, of, or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things cons consist. Colossians 1, 16 and 17. He also controls all things by upholding all things by the word of his power. Hebrews 1, 3. And he will consummate all things as well. See Ephesians 1, 10. Yes, Jesus Christ is Alpha and Omega the beginning, and the ending. The terminology I am, the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, expresses Christ's oneness with the Father. See verse 4. In fact, he adds the term the Almighty, a name used for the Father in connection with his person. This term is used 48 times in the Old Testament. This verse clearly refutes the doctrine of anti uh, trinarity, tr um, oh my goodness, the doctrine of anti trinarianism, um, which is anti God, anti Christ, 
and anti-Holy Spirit. Verse 9, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Um, John realizes <clears throat> that he is an old man and highly revered, yet he wants no praise from men for his sufferings. He immediately identifies himself as a brother in Christ and a companion in heartache and suffering. He tells of the tribulation he endured during his incarceration at Patmos, but he rejoices that the other blood-bought sons of God will miss the tribulation. How true. The Savior stated, In the world ye shall have tribulation. John 16, 33. However, this does not include the tribulation hour out of which the saints are kept. See Revelation 3, 10. John's persecution came because of his devotion to Christ. This is always true when one takes a stand for the Savior. Jesus said in John 15, 18 through 20, if the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Verse 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. <sighs> Beginning with this verse, we enter into the revelation experience with John and observe firsthand all that is presented to him through the remainder of the um, through the remainder of the book. Joseph A. Cease says that John was carried forward through the centuries until he saw a vision of the great and terrible day of the Lord, the tribulation hour. A majority of scholars, however, believe that the phrase on the Lord's Day refers to the first day of the week, thus on Resurrection Day, Sunday, the first day of the week. Um, John is visited by the one who had so loved him <clears throat> while on earth, Jesus himself. As he appears, John hears the trumpet-like voice of Christ. Verse 11 saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest write in a book, and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Perg Pergamos, and unto Thyteria, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Alpha and Omega are the titles we discussed in verse 8. Verse 11 pictures the eternal Christ giving instructions to his beloved servant concerning the seven churches mentioned in verse 4 and to be discussed in chapters 2 and 3. Um, then John adds in verse 12, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. When the trumpet-like voice of Christ sounded in, vo in verse 11, John turned to see the voice that spoke to him. This is different. One does not normally see a voice. Yet John turned to see the voice. As he looks in that direction, he sees seven golden candlesticks or lampstands. Verse 20 clearly expa explains the meaning of verse 12. As follows, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks means this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. The fact that there are seven churches are pictured as seven lampstands is significant because believers are the light of the world. Matthew 5, 14. Sad, um, as we shall see, is the fact that the history of the seven churches often diminished that light. I'll pray that it shall not be so in your life. 
Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 5, 16. Now that we have observed verse 12, in light of verse 20, let's take a closer look at the glorious Savior who appeared, um, who appears in the midst of the lampstands or churches. Verse 13, And I saw in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paths with a golden girdle. The Lord is clothed with the garments of the Old Testament high priest because he is risen and in heaven, performing his ministry of intercession. For this reason, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Hebrews 7, 25. Thus, 60 years after Christ's death and resurrection, John sees him as the high priest in the heavenlies. Paul also testifies to this blessed fact by stating, See and then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. Hebrews 4, 14. Next, our precious Lord is described in detail. Verse 14, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. John's description speaks of antiquity and coincides with the vision Daniel had in chapter 7, verse 9 through 13, that this ancient of days, the eternal one, Jesus Christ, is also pictured in terms of whiteness because of his righteousness, for he is holy harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Hebrews 7, 26. The Greek also emphasizes the fact that his eyes shot out fire. Christ is righteously angry concerning the sin of the churches depicted in Revelations chapter 2 and 3, which we're getting to. Um, but verse 15, And his feet were like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice was as the sound of many waters. Christ's feet picture judgment and relate to the events that take place when he returns to earth in chapters 19 and 20. His voice as the, sounds, as the sound of many waters also depicts judgment. Verse 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in, in his strength. The seven stars of this verse are the angels or messengers of the seven churches. See verse 20. While the two-edged sword is the word of God, as described in Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the, um, of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Then the expression, his countenance, was as the sun shineth in his strength, takes our minds back to the transfiguration scene in Matthew 17, 2, and thus pictures the glory of Christ, who is to be the judge during the great tribulation hour. Armageddon and the great white throne assembly of Revelation 20, 11 through 15. Because of it, John is stunned, astonished, and humbled at the experience and cries in verse 17, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Verse 18, For I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell, or Hades, and of death. The sight of Christ glorified was breathtaking. And the one who laid his head upon Jesus at the Last Supper now falls prostrate at his feet. As John falls before his blessed Lord in fear, 
Jesus lovingly says, fear not. He is saying the same to us today. In the midst of wars, rumors of wars, heartache and death, the blessed Lord says, let not your heart be troubled. John 14, 1. This message to John is from the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega, the eternal one, Jesus Christ, the one that liveth, the resurrection, and was dead, crucifixion, and who cries, behold, I am alive forevermore, ascension. Amen. He also has the keys of hell and of death. And because of this tremendous fact, Christians are not to fear, for through death, Christ destroyed him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Not only have we been delivered from the fear of death, but from the fear of Hades as well. Let me explain. Um, Hades was the place where the souls and the spirits of all humans went until the cross. Sheol, Old Testament, and Hades, New Testament, were one and the same. In Sheol and Hades, um, there were two compartments, one for the wicked and the other for the righteous. In Luke 16, 22 and 23, the rich man and Lazarus went to their respective places, one to suffering and the other to comfort. The thief on the cross went to the comfort side or paradise, <coughs> as promised by Christ. When he said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Luke 23, 43. This is where Christ went upon his death. Acts 2, 27 and 31. There he ministered to his people and led captivity captive. Ephesians 4, 8 through, 8 through 10. Literally releasing them for their entrance into the third heaven of 2 Corinthians 12, 2. Presently, the comfort side of Hades has been emptied by him who has the keys of death and Hades or hell. But the torment side is still full. This will be emptied um, for the judgment day when death and Hades deliver up the dead which are in them and they are judged. <coughs> Revelations 20 verse 13. Verse 19. Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. This verse gives us the order of the book of Revelation, which is written chronologically, or as the events happen. One immediately recognizes the three tenses, past, present, and future. Write the things which thou hast seen, past. Chapter 1, the things which are, present. Chapter 2 and 3, and the things which shall be, hereafter, the future, chapters 4 through 22. Verse 20, God explains to John the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Since, sorry, <laughs> since we have discussed the closing verse of this chapter in connection with verse 12, let us move on to the study of the seven candlesticks or the history of the seven churches. Chapters 2 and 3 contain seven letters to the seven literal local churches mentioned um, in chapter 1 verse 11. These letters have a number of applications. First, they are seven actual letters to seven actual churches situated in seven different cities. Second, they are letters to seven individuals within the seven churches. And third, they are messages applicable to all churches in all ages. For the seven churches picture seven periods or stages of church history in each period, the Lord speaks to the churches in a judgmental way, portraying their failures. Then he calls them to repentance and zealousness. Ephesians, verse 1, 
unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks for the seven churches represented throughout history. Or the seven churches represented throughout history. The first church addressed is the church of Ephesus, covering the time period from approximately 33 AD, which is the birth of the church at Pentecost, until 100 AD, when John, who wrote the book of Revelation, died. The letter is to the angel, or literally the messenger of the church of Ephesus, and is from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. This, of course, is the glorified Christ, as we learned in chapter 1, verse 20. How thrilling to note that the Lord both holds the churches, all believers, in his hand and walks in the midst of them as well. This is the Christian security. The Savior's walk among us is to bring us closer to himself. Next, Christ speaks in verse 2, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars. Notice that in each of the seven letters, the Lord begins by commending the local assembly for whatever he can find in them that is good before scolding them um, for their sins. The Ephesus church began in all purity, as can be observed from a study of the book of Acts. Then false prophets entered in. This is exactly the warning Paul had sounded during his last gathering in Ephesus. For know this that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember. Acts 20, verse 29 through 31. The leaders of the church judged these false prophets in earlier days, but became lax as they lost their first love. Today many think, it is wrong to judge heresy and wickedness, but it not so. The same Christ who said, who said, Judge not that ye be not judged in Matthew 7, 1, also declared, Judge righteous judgment in John 7, 24. A believer is never to judge a person as far as motives are concerned. However, he should definitely judge one when that individual's doctrine is heretical, um, heretical, or his life is filled with wickedness. This is why John said, try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. 1 John 4, 1. And why Paul stated in 1 Timothy five nineteen and 20, against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses, them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. The church of Ephesus had slipped from its original moorings and was on the way down. Is it any wonder that the Mohammedanism, that, this is quite the word, Mohammedanism um, swept through the land and destroy, destroyed the compromising church that once was under mighty Paul? Um, verse 3, <laughs> and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Part of the reason this church, who has borne, who had borne, and had patience, and for his name's sake had labored, and had not fainted, um, failed, may have been that they were too busy serving, and not taking time for sweet fellowship at the feet of Jesus. When one is so active that he has no time for the Bible and prayer, he is too busy. Many have fallen to the indictment of verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. And how true of multitudes today. 
When they were first saved, they loved Jesus, loved to pray, loved to read the word, loved to attend the service, the services at God's house, and loved to witness. But they have lost that first love. Verse 5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick, or your local church, out of his place, except thou repent. It happened. After the conquest of Mohammedanism, the church of Ephesus became non-existent. Do not let this happen to your church or to you. Before God finishes his um, pronouncement of co commendations and condemnations upon the church of Ephesus, he adds in verse 6, But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nic Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So who were the Nicolaitans, and what was it about them that so angered Almighty God? The term comes from two Greek words, which mean victory over laity, a religious dictatorship that allowed little or no freedom to its members. This is precisely what the Holy Spirit had in mind when he told the church elders not to be lords over God's heritage, but in samples, examples to the flock. 1 Peter 5, 3 how this message needs to be emphasized in our day as religious leaders try to impose their man-made rules on each and every member. A after presenting this series of commend commendations and warnings, the Spirit of God adds in verse 7, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. How can one be an overcomer? By trusting in the merits of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? 1 John 5, 5. And verse 8, And unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive, we saw in chapter 1, verse 11, that this first and the last, or Alpha and Omega, is the Lord Jesus Christ. He now begins his message to the next church, Smyrna. Verse 9. I know thy works, and tribulation, and poverty, but thou art rich, <coughs> but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, and are not what are the synagogue of Satan? The Smyrna period of church history takes us from 100 AD to 312 AD. These people probably suffered the greatest persecution in all Christianity. Their works faithfully performed in the name of Jesus brought great, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, brought great tribulation and accompanying poverty <sighs> materially. Um, however, great riches were laid up for them in heaven. In addition, their relentless, dedicated efforts brought the word of God to the entire Roman Empire. During the second and third centuries, the Smyrna church members were fed to the lions at Rome while multitudes cheered. Church history informs us that five million may have been martyred during this era. Every Christian ought to read um, Fox's Christian Martyrs of the World. He will quickly discover the foolishness of complaining in this day of luxury and ease. Unless, of course, you're in one of those places that are killing um, Christians, torturing Christians. But believe it or not, the church flourished and grew during the Smyrna period. Perhaps a little persecution would do us some good today. We might learn to love other brothers in Christ who have a different religious label than ours. God forgive us for our sectarianism. Much of Smyrna's heartache came through false, um, came through false profess, um, professors of religion. Those who said they were Jews 
as defined in Romans 2.29, circumcised of the heart and the spirit rather than the letter, but who in reality were not. They did not really believe and were actually members of the synagogue of Satan. Beware of those um, who claim to be Christians but deny the deity of Christ. They too are of the synagogue of Satan. For every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. 1 John 4, 3. The same is true of those who mix law and grace. Paul said, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you? Let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Galatians 1, 6-9 Because of the false brethren propagating false doctrine and despising the true believers, persecution came from within and from without. In the face of such satanic opposition, Christ's message was, verse 10, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. But thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. When the hour of trial arrived, the believers were not to fear. They were to keep their eyes on eternal rewards, as mentioned in James 1.12. Blessed is the man that endureth testing, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Many Bible scholars believe that the ten days of persecution consisted of ten literal periods of suffering, and I agree. Since church history empathetically supports this assertion, um, still the church of Smyrna was guaranteed final victory through the Lord's promise, power, and provision. Verse 11, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. <sighs> Pergamus, verse 12, and to the angel of the church of Pergamus write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. Again, chapter 1, verse 16, proves that the speaker is the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 13, I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. The letters to the first three churches begin with a commendation. To each Christ says, I know thy works. God sees what we do for him. How sad when backsliding destroys the many good deeds performed in his name. We see this strange twist at Pergamus. Here the bad works outweigh the good ones. This church period, extending from 312 A.D. to 606 A.D., was one of, the mater one of materialism, self-indulgence, and worldliness. Wickedness spread like a, bush, uh, like a brush fire. The name Pergamus has in it the same root from which we get our English words bigamy and polygamy. Pergamus signifies a mixed marriage of the church and the world. This happened because the Babylonian religion established its headquarters at Pergamus and infiltrated Christianity. No wonder this local church is charged with dwelling in the area of Satan's seat or literally throne. They were perched on the doorstep of the devil's headquarters. Of necessity, the believer in Christ is in the world. However, he must constantly guard against becoming involved in its ungodliness. The Church of Pergamus became part and parcel of Satan's worldly establishment. They called themselves by Christ's name, Christians, 
and made verbal and written assent, assent to the faith, even though they saw the danger of martyrism, um, martyrdom in the example of Antipas. Nevertheless, they backslid. Verse 14. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. The first grievance against the church of Pergamos was the fact that they had embraced the pleasures of the world or become a worldly church. Secondly, they had given heed to false doctrine, the theology of Balaam. Remember Balaam? He had a smart donkey. Um, how sad to be famous because of one's donkey. The animal was so smart it could out-talk Balaam. Um, what was the doctrine of Balaam taught to Balak? First, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and second, to commit fornication. Balak had hired Balaam to curse Israel, and Balaam, the false prophet, was unable to get the anointing of Satan upon his spirit for the task. So he figured out a plan of destruction for the Jews. He said, let the choice of the women of Balak's kingdom display themselves before the eyes of God's people. As expected, the Jewish men became enamored with the beauty of the daughters of Balak's kingdoms, committed fornication with them married them, and were eventually drawn into idolatry. This was so wrong. Those who name the name of Jesus are not to become involved with the world in any manner. For ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord's table and the table of the devils. 1 Corinthians 10, 21. You know... We very recently just finished Halloween, and you know what was so sad to me was seeing how many Christian pages and groups um, on Facebook was saying, it's okay, go ahead and celebrate Halloween. I saw one saying, it's All Saints Day. Christians um, should all be celebrating. These are, this is a pagan holiday. It has not been redeemed for Christians. It celebrates evil. It celebrates idolatry. Um, it celebrates the idea of changing your identity as um, who God made you. That that you're just not, you know, the, wanting to put on costumes and be something that you're not. And then you look at what some of these costumes, while some seem to be perfectly harmless, God made you perfect as you are. And others are just satanic, um, witches, zombies, ghosts, um, demons we are not to follow the world verse 15 so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans which things I hate not only were the people of the first church of per, um, Pergamus worldly Pergamus sorry worldly sinful and idolatrous but they also shared in the wicked practice of the Nicolaitanism um, as did the Church of Ephesus. This again is ecclesiastical Hitlerism. Um, it is when the minister or leader says, I am the head, and you have no choice in the matter. Allowing laymen no voice in the affairs of the church concerning the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, the, condemn the condemnatory statement, which things I hate, is uttered. <clears throat> um, by the Lord God himself. What's the solution? Verse 16. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. This is serious business. The Christian is not to close his mind, heart, and ears to God's warning. Verse 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and it, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. As previously noted, the overcomer is the true believer in Jesus. See First John 5 verse 4. He is given the hidden manna, the word of God, and is presented a white stone. 
During ancient court trials, the jurors would lay down white stones to signify a decision of <coughs> a decision of acquittal. Praise the Lord, um, through the blood of Jesus, the white stones of acquittal have been presented, and every Christian has a new name written down in glory. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, I have trouble um, pronouncing this next church, so bear with me. Thyatira, Thyatira, it's T-H-Y-A-T-I-R-A, Thyatira. Um, verse 18, and unto the angel of the church in Thyatira, write these things, saith the Son of God, who hath eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Once again, we speaker, we see that the speaker is the Son of God. The description of his eyes and feet were discussed in chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. Verse 19, I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. To this point, all four churches have been complimented for their works. Thetiria, however, was loaded with materious service and unusual deeds. She was known for her good works, love, service, faith, patience, and last works. The term last works means that this church outdid herself. Her works became greater towards the end of her lifetime than they were at the beginning. Historically, Thyatira, Thyatira covers the years 606 AD to 1520 AD. However, many scholars believe this church is found in the world until she is destroyed by the revived Roman Empire in chapter 17 and 18. Although Thyatira had many admi admirable qualities, she nevertheless had some deep-rooted problems as well. Verse 20, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Who was Jezebel? In the Old Testament, she was perhaps the most wicked woman of her day. She became so hated that she was thrown from a window, and the dogs ate her flesh. The sin of this self-appointed prophetess was to bring ba Baalism into Israel as a new religion. She is accused of seducing God's servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. This constituted the breaking of two of God's commandments to his people Israel. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, and thou shalt not commit adultery. Exodus 20, verse 4 and 5 and 14. God called upon Thyatira to turn from her wicked ways. Verse 21. I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. The long-suffering and loving God gave Thyatira approximately 1,000 years to do what was right, but she resisted. How many, um, how like many 21st century Christians constantly rejecting the wooings of the blessed Holy Spirit. The result in verse 22, behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Judgment always comes. Be sure your sin will find you out. Numbers 32, 23. The Lord promises to cast this church and her bed partners, those who have partaken of her abominable, abominable iniquity, including idolatry and unfaithfulness to the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, into the great tribulation. At that point, the church which sits upon seven hills, chapter 17, verse 9, will be destroyed. The details concerning this event are discussed in chapters 17 and 18. Um, the obvious lesson here is that God hates sin. Sentimentalists say, 
Oh, the blessed, loving Jesus would never condemn anyone. Really? Really? We know that God is love. 1 John 4, 8. And God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. John 3, 17. Nevertheless, when his love is repeatedly spurned and one deliberately follows a course of sin, God's holiness demands that the sinner be punished. Remember, Christ himself is speaking in the following verse, verse 23. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts and I will give on to every one of you according to your works. How sad that the church of Thyteria so highly praised for good works in the opening passages um, must be horribly judged because of having undergone every good thing that had been originally performed in the name of the Savior. Likewise, today it is possible for the Christian to lose every reward he has he has earned. So look to yourselves that you lose not those things which you have wrought or earned. Um, 2 John verse 8. The only good news concerning Thyteria was that a remnant remained faithful in spite of the deterioration of this local church. Verse 24. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyteria, as many as have not this doctrine and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none of none other burden. The Lord Jesus informed John that those who did not succumb to Jezebel's theological follies or fall into the fornication and idolatry propagated by this false Babylonian religion would not have any other burden. They had experienced enough heartache. Verse 25, but that which ye have already hold fast till I, sorry, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. Here is the faithful remnant. Um, the faithful remnant was admonished to continue in the truth of God's word until Jesus returned. Verse 26, and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Verse 27, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. Verse 28, and I will give him the morning star. Christ has promised faithful believers three rewards upon his return to the earth. Rulership over the nations during the millennium for they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Chapter 20, verse 4. Sharing in this glorious time of perfect righteousness, resulting from Christ's personal enforcement and order. See Psalms 2, verse 8 and 9. And the abiding presence of the blessed Savior throughout time and eternity, as Christ himself, the bright and morning star, reigns. Chapter 22, verses 14 and 16. If your life is not what it once was for Christ, don't be a loser when rewards are distributed. Instead, about face. Live for him. Heed the warning of the next verse. Verse 29. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So let's move on to the next church, the fifth letter, written to the local church in Sardis is also from the Savior, for Christ has the seven stars in his right hand in chapter 1, verse 16. And again, the Savior begins by commending Sardis for her works. This is chapter 3, verse 1. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. And art dead. Sardis began in 1520 AD and undoubtedly extends historically into the tribulation. This period of time covers the reformation with its dead lukewarm churches and, it's, and is presently part of the Laocedian period as well. 
The reason for the deadness is that during the Reformation, entire countries became Protestant without being born again. Protestantism was made the state religion and was freely embraced by millions who did not know what it meant to become new cre creations in Christ Jesus. See 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Thus Sardis became the mother of death, orthodoxy. Her theme song was not standing on the promises, but sleeping on the promises. Her members were dead. God help us to have life. Hundreds of churches follow Sardis' lead, Sardis's lead today. This is the reason millions are leaving liberal churches for good old-fashioned gospel preaching lighthouse, um, lighthouses. Immediately, God called for a five-fold revival package. Verse 2, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember there, um, verse 3, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast, and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Sardis was admonished to, number one, be watchful or alert, knowing the time, that now it is a high time to awake out of sleep. And Romans 13, 11, um, that was Romans 13, 11, and also to strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. Her people were to do everything possible to salvage um, the little good that still remained in their bastion of dead orthodoxy. And number three, remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard. The Sardis Christians <laughs> were commanded to, to recall the former days, the early days of their salvation, when they were filled with purity and zeal. And number four, hold fast. They were to retain the simple truth of the gospel and discard the excess baggage of ecclesiastical pomp and ceremony. And five, to repent. They were to change their minds. Christ's call was not for personal repentance, but for the entire church. Yea, the entire movement to change. The Reformation churches needed to turn back to Christ, seeking his will and his spirit's teaching, rather than man-made ideas about theological truth. One, um, one of the areas of truth the Reformation churches failed to proclaim was the return of Christ. Therefore the Lord said that this event would catch them unawares. Thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. No wonder many of the present day offspring of the Re Reformation have ministers who say, no one can understand the book of Revelation. It is a deep, mysterious, symbolical, figurative book. That's baloney. Preacher, layman, you are the one Christ had in mind. Awake thou that sleepest, and Christ shall raise you from the dead, spiritually speaking. In the midst of this deadness, Sardis had a few who could still wiggle spiritually. Verse 4, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. There are not very many of us watching and waiting for the return of Jesus or for the rapture of the church. Um, if you're a part of very many of the communities, um, you probably don't realize how few we really are. And this is something that Christians argue over. But we see here that we were told to watch. And, if, and there's a warning that if you don't watch, the day will overcome you like a thief in the night. It's very clear we are to watch for the return of Jesus. He's going to be calling us to meet him in the clouds very soon. We know the day. We know the hour. We know the season that we're in. Don't let anyone discourage you. 
verse four. We're gonna we're gonna um keep going here. Um, I'm gonna go back to verse four again. I just wanted to say this, um, make that comment to you guys. But thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Though the Reformation churches, like the mother out of whom they came, did not practice holiness unto the Lord, they were individuals who did not defile their garments in compromise with the world, the flesh, and the devil. They came out from among them and touched not the unclean thing. 2 Corinthians 6.17 As a result, they were promised the reward of being clothed in white garments as stated in the latter part of verse 4 and in verse 5. Um, verse 5, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. This white raiment is found upon the bride of Christ at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let us, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. Notice that's the marriage of the lamb is first. And his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Revelation 19, 7 and 8. In addition, those who possess a genuine salvation experience will remain in the book of life eternally. We are secure. What security? Um, Christ says, I will not blot out his name before my Father and before his angels. Verse 6. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Make sure your experience is real. Make sure you are putting your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ and in him alone. And don't let anyone steal your crown. Watch for him. Wait for him. Trust in him. And I want to tell you, nobody who puts their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ will be disappointed. I promise you. This brings us to Philadelphia. Let's progress to the next church. The sixth letter is written to the church of Philadelphia and covers historically the years from 1750 until the rapture. Verse 7, and to the angel or messenger of the church of Philadelphia, write these things, saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. Once again, the message is from the Lord Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ. However, instead of gleaning a picture from chapter 1, as we have in the past, we are now given a new and beautiful fourfold description of the Lord, he that is holy. One finds this description of Christ in Hebrews 7.26, he that is true. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14.6. He that hath the key of David. Jesus again said, I am the root and the offspring of David, chapter 22, verse 16. And he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Christ is not only the one who opens the door, but he is the door. John 10, 9. Christ's commendation, um, commended, commendum, commendation is presented to the local church of Philadelphia, in verses 8 through 10, verse 8, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. And verse 9, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. 
verse 10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which will come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. We immediately realize from this text that the church of Philadelphia is loaded <coughs> with good works. The open door speaks of missions and the church covering this era of time undoubtedly has done and is doing more than any other group ever attempted to do in the annals of history. Thank God for such vision. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Proverbs 29, 18. Although this group does so much, they are still a minority, for they had a little strength. One of their great strengths was that they kept his name. Since the Church of Philadelphia extends into our 21st century and even to the point of the rapture, the command for each of us today is that we never deny his name. For if we deny him, he also will deny us. 2 Timothy 2.12 Oh, the tremendous loss that some will experience at the judgment seat of Christ. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 5.10 Christ also promises these faithful brethren that the members of the synagogue of Satan, false professors of religion as described in chapter 2 verse 9, <clears throat> will be forced to bow and worship the Lord God Almighty willfully or unwillingly or unwillfully um, at a future time. Chapter 3, verse 9. That's actually water in my Mountain Dew bottle. In case you're wondering, I'm not actually sitting here chugging Mountain Dew. <laughs> um, but this could be at the judgment day. For Paul informed the children of God that they would share with Christ in judgment. Hear him. Do ye not know the saints will judge the world? 1 Corinthians 6, 2. Christ himself spoke of that time when he stated, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Romans 14, 11. Finally, because of their love for Christ, the Philadelphia era believers are promised exemption from the day of the Lord's wrath or the great tribulation hour. I will keep thee from the hour of temptation. Chapter 3, verse 10. In the Greek, word um, from is ek, ek, meaning out of. God promises to keep the Philadelphia believers out of, not through preservation, but out of. That means evacuation, the tribulation. Thus the church will be gone when the terrible hour of tribulation judgment comes upon all the world to try the earth dwellers. Praise God. This world is not my home. I'm only passing through. We believers are not earth dwellers, for our citizenship is in heaven. See Philippians 3.20. In the light of the coming of Christ, an admonition is given in the next verse. Verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Here the Christian is warned to be faithful, lest all rewards, not salvation, but rewards, be lost. Even the loss of one's crown. The promise of verse 12 is to those who are faithful. Verse 12, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Three blessings are mentioned for the faithful. They become pillars in the temple of God. They have the name of God written upon them, thus identifying them and allowing them access into the city of God. The New Jerusalem described in Revelation 21 and 22 and they have the new name written upon them. The name of God allows them to enter the holy city, but the new name of Christ entitles them to be his servants, where they shall see his face. Chapter 22, verse 3 and 4. Because the future blessings are so wonderful, the, the ad admonition continues. 
verse 13, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Laodicea, the seventh and final letter is to the local church of Laodicea, which covers the years from 1900 to the tribulation hour. The message, as in all the previous letters, is from the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 14, and unto the angel of the church of, Laod of Laodiceans, write these things saith the Amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. This threefold description of the Savior includes the Amen. In Hebrew, this word means true. The complete meaning is truth in its finality, which pictures Christ as the final truth, the faithful and true witness. This statement links Christ to chapter 1, verse 5, where he is called true and the beginning of the creation of God, since the Lord is the firstborn of all creation. See Colossians 1.15. Um, we again recognize him as the speaker. Verse 15. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. The Laodicean church also has works, but her services are rendered in a lukewarm fashion. What a picture of the present age. Some of our churches are so cold that signs above the door could advertise these religious refrigerators as First Church of the Deep Freeze, pastored by Dr. Jack Frost. The situation is so drastic that whereas parishioners used to quote the verse, many are called, but few are chosen, they now think that new reverse version states, many are cold and a few are frozen. God alone knows how serious the present situation literally is. We have churches today that are um, definitely bringing the worldly propagandas and agendas into the church and it's frightening. Verse 16, so then because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. The condition of the Laodicean church makes God so violently ill that he wants to spew this group out of his mouth. What do you see happening today? We see AI rewriting the Bible. We see AI preaching sermons. We see um, sin being flaunted. The alphabet people calling themselves priests and pastors and misleading the flocks. They, we see them changing the Gospels. We see them changing the... Um, preaching the false doc. It's it's sickening what we're seeing happening in the church today. Um, actually, was it uh, the church in Europe or the UK? They want to give God pronouns. Of course he's sickened by what he's seeing the condition of the Laodicean church makes God so violently ill that he wants to spew this group out of his mouth. The Greek word is emeo, E-M-E-O, from which we get the word emetic. And emetic is given to one who has swallowed poison in order to make him regurgitate. Think of that. A lukewarm church is an emetic to Christ. But what's the reason for this lukewarmness, coldness, indifference and carnality. I think I just covered a few of those issues. Um, but verse 17 says, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. The Laocedian um, era is a highly prosperous one. As a result, her people have erected elaborate churches um, church structures worth millions of dollars. Stop a moment and consider the money presently being invested in buildings used one to three hours weekly. Laodicean pastors often attack the electronic church ministries. The command of Jesus is, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark 16, 15. 
However, the electronic church ministers are simply obeying the Savior. God help each of us to see that although buildings are necessary for worship and service, they should be humble edifices rather than the latest multi-million dollar architectural monstrosities which glorify men. And in all honesty, we are the temple. We are the church, not a building. The Holy Spirit resides in us. Um, God tells us that the Laodiceans, um, God tells the Laodiceans that they are really wretched and miserable, poor, spiritually, though rich materially, blind and naked. This is true because Riches usually make one wretched and miserable. One spends 40 years accumulating his wealth and final 30 years keeping others from getting it. The Laodiceans are also blind because they cannot see the need of the millions who are dying without the Savior and going into eternal loss. Because of this fact, they are naked both now and in eternity, for they are not clothed with Christ's robe of righteousness. See 2 Corinthians 5.21. His plea to them is um, verse 18. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, and thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Christ instructs the, the Laodiceans to buy of me <coughs> gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. This probably refers to 1 Peter 1, 7, where the trial of our faith is more than of gold. By a white raiment, undoubtedly, the reference is to the garment of salvation and the robe of righteousness mentioned in Isaiah 61, 10, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. This speaks of the illumination which only the saved share. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2.14 Because of the conditions prevalent in the Laodicean church, the Lord states in verse 19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. This message reminds us of Hebrews 12.6, which states, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Spiritual spankings are administered in order that we may be zealous and repent, or change our minds. He continues in verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. This verse is actually a picture of Christ standing outside the door of the Latter-day Church rather than the heart of an individual, as we so often hear stated. Presently, entire churches and denominations are barring the Savior's entrance. He's not even welcome in the church, and it's unbelievable. However, those who listen to his appeal open the door and follow Jesus, and they will not be sorry. No one who puts their faith and trust in Jesus will ever be sorry. Verse 21, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Finally, one last time, the Lord proclaims the warning. Verse 22, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches. The spirit is absolutely speaking to us. We need to hear it. We need to hear him. And that brings us to chapter four. And I could probably stop at the end of the churches and save chapter four for another day. I understand this video is long. It's going to take me forever to upload it. Um, my internet where I upload is horrible. But I cannot end this video without continuing on to see what happens next. And that is the rapture of the church. Chapter four begins with the prophetic future. Remember chapter 1, verse 19, write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. 
that text presented three tenses and informed us that the book of Revelation is written in chronological order. The past, chapter 1, the present, chapter 2 and 3, and the history of the seven churches to the present time, and the future, chapters 4 through 22. Now let's take a peek at what's coming. Verse 1. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet, talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. John states, After this. After what? After the completion of the history of the seven churches. After this, John sees a door opened in heaven and hears a trumpet-like voice loudly, victoriously, crying, Come up hither. This is the rapture <coughs> of the Church of Jesus Christ. When it occurs, multitudes from all kindreds, peoples, tongues, and denominations will meet the Savior face to face. That's what I'm waiting for now. That's what we're waiting for right now. It's ex a very exciting time to be alive. So what is the rapture? It is the literal, visible, bodily coming of Jesus Christ to call out of this world literally and bodily every born-again believer, first the dead, then the living. First, we see that Jesus is coming boldly, bodily, I'm sorry. Um, he's coming bodily. Remember the cultists of bygone days who said that the Lord was about to return? Clothed in white sheets, they sat on the mountainsides in anxious anticipation. But Christ didn't come. Date setting is wrong. Um, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Matthew 24, 36. Because of their embarrassment, these cultists immediately stated, Oh, we were right. Christ did come, but it was an invisible manifestation. He came as a spirit, and that is not so. When Jesus Christ returns, both in the rapture, chapter 4, and at his revelation, chapter 19, he will come literally, visibly, and bodily. Proof? Acts 1, 9-11, And when Jesus had spoken these things, while they beheld... He was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which um, also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner, as ye, ha as ye have seen him go into heaven. The Lord will return exactly as he left. And how did he leave? Well, let's see. In Luke 24, 39, Christ appeared to his disciples and said, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. Then in verse 41 and 42, he went on to say, Have ye here any meat or food? And they gave him a piece of broiled frit of broiled fish and of an honeycomb. And he took it and he did eat it before them. The Lord Jesus Christ possessed a new resurrected body, a body that could be seen, a body that could be touched, and a body that could partake of food, a literal body. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of, of Cephas, and then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above, or over five hundred brethren at once. After that, he was seen of James. And last of all, he was seen of me, Paul. Also, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. Um, no doubt about it, when he returns and the shout, Come up hither, is given, we will see him. At this glorious moment, we too shall receive new bodies. The Bible teaches in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, 
and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Notice that the dead in Christ shall rise first. Perhaps this is because they have six feet further to rise um, to the level of the living. Um, then all of us together are caught up into the heavens to meet the Lord Jesus Christ in the twinkling of an eye. You don't believe it? Then listen, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, which means be dead, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we, the living, shall be changed. Watch it, for this corruptible, the dead in Christ, must put on incorruption, and this mortal, the living in Christ, must put on immortality. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 54. How fast is the twinkling of an eye? Close your eyes for a moment and then open them. And that's it. General Electric Company tells us that the twinkling of an eye is 11 one hundredths of a second. Just that quickly. At that blessed moment, we shall be changed to be like Jesus. David said, I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Psalm 17, 15. And John adds that when we see Jesus, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. 1 John 3, 2. Then Paul, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, states, he shall, he shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Philippians 3, 21. This then is the rapture. Some Christians say they do not believe in the term rapture. They argue that one cannot find the word rapture in the Bible. Interestingly, one cannot find the term Bible in the Bible either, but I'm holding one. Listen carefully. The word rapture is, the, the word rapture in English comes from the Latin uh, repimur, which means a snatching away. We have just learned from God's word that all Christians, living and dead, are going to be snatched away in the twinkling of an eye. So whether one knows it or not, one believes in the rapture. The Bible also clearly teaches that there is a difference between the rapture and the revelation of Christ. We need to fully understand this truth because it is the basis for understanding the book of Revelation, prophetic truth, and the placement of signs. Simply stated, there are two aspects or stages um, in the process of Christ's second coming, and both begin with the letter R. We have already designated the first phase as the rapture. The second phase is called the revelation. Chapter 4 describes phase 1, while phase 2 is described in chapter 19. The intervening chapters 6 through 18 basically cover a seven-year period called the tribulation. The rapture, chapter 4, precedes the tribulation, and the revelation, chapter 19, follows the seven-year period of judgment. Chapter 4 is a meeting in the air whereas chapter 19 is a return to the earth. Chapter 4 removes the believer from judgments, um, from the judgments described in chapters 6 through 18, and chapter 19 restores the believer to his earthly sojourn as he returns with Christ to planet earth. The come up hither of Revelation 4.1 is synonymous with the call of 1 Thessalonians 4.16 and 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Immediately following this event, the inhabitants of planet Earth experience seven years of <coughs> incomparable judgment. This judgment ends with the battle of Armageddon, at which time the door of heaven is again opened, see chapter 19, verse 11 through 16, in order that the believer may exist, uh, may exit heaven with Christ for the, the return trip to, um, to earth. The return of Christ 
with his saints is called the revelation and comes from the word revealing. At that time, the Lord will reveal himself to all humanity. So why not call this event the revealing or revelation um, of Christ? And let's not quibble about the, label, the labels concerning the rapture and the revelation. The truths are there. Believe them. The labels only help one organize the teaching system at, um, system, systematically. The question often arises, will the Church of Jesus Christ be on the earth during the tribulation hour? The answer is an empathetic no. The church is mentioned 16 times in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, but is not found in chapters 6 through 18, the tribulation period. Why? First of all, the tribulation is Israel's time of suffering. Alas, for that day is great, so that, the, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Jeremiah 37. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, um, which standeth for the children of thy people, Israel. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people, the Israelites, shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book, Daniel 12.1. Secondly, the first 69 weeks of Daniel's prophecy involved Israel. Why wouldn't the 70th week? The Bible is plain. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, the Israelites, and upon thy holy city, Jerusalem. Daniel 9.24 That is why the signs in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, and 21 have to do with Israel and the Middle East. Thirdly, during the tribulation hour, the people involved are instructed to pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Matthew 24, 20. Israel is eternally identified with the Sabbath day. See Ezekiel 20, 12 and 20. Fourthly, when Christ returns to Jerusalem, see Zechariah 14, 4, all the tribes of the earth mourn. See Matthew 24, 30. The mourners are the 12 tribes of Israel, numbering hundreds of thousands of individuals who were brought to repentance by the preaching of the 144,000 Jewish representatives from each of the 12 tribes, 12,000 per tribe. Finally, the persons experiencing the woes of the tribulation hour are never called a synagogue, but rather the church, Acts 2.47. As already stated, the church cannot be found in Revelation 6 through 18. The portion of the book described the horrible tribulation hour Israel, however, is seen in the midst of the Holocaust. Uh, see Revelation 12, 1 through 13. This correlates with the elect of Matthew 24, 22. Jesus said, and except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, <coughs> but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. This elect group is not the church, but Israel. For God has two elect groups upon the earth, the church and Israel. First, let's look at the church. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Ephesians 1, 4. This chosen group is called the elect in 1 Peter 1, verse 2. However, the church, the bride of Christ, elected to be his sweetheart and wife for all eternity, is not in view in Matthew 24, 22. Instead, this text has Israel, the wife of Jehovah, in mind. What? How can that be? Where, where was Israel chosen? Well, in Genesis 12, 2 and 3, God said, And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curses thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. In Deuteronomy 7, verse 7 and 8, the Israelites were again reminded of their elect status. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people, but because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, he chose you. This oath that chooses Israel as an elect group of people has never been 
never been abrogated um, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance or without change of mind, Romans eleven twenty nine, Because of God's unchanging covenant or oath, Romans eleven twenty six through 28 declares, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins as touching the elect, the election, the elect. Um, they are beloved for their father's sake. When God chose Israel, his elect wife, he chose her forever because the calling of God is without change of mind. Though Jehovah's spouse has often committed spiritual adultery by turning to iniquity and idolatry, still Jehovah loves her because God abides faithful. There is no doubt about it. Israel is the elect group mentioned in the Gospels for whom the days of judgment will be shortened. Israelites are the ones who will pray that their flight for safety will not be on the Sabbath, their day of worship, who will suffer persecution in their own synagogues. Only Jews meet in synagogues and who have the name of Jacob and who will experience Jacob's time of trouble. See Jeremiah 30 verse 7. For Jacob is Israel. See Romans 11.26. Hence, a period of 70 weeks is determined upon Israel. See Daniel 9.24. The nation of Israel has seen Jerusalem compassed about with armies. Luke 21.20. And will again observe the armies of the world poised against Jerusalem for the final war as God gathers all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Zechariah 14.2, this definitely is not the church. All Christians slipped out through the open door in the fourth chapter before the judgment of heaven and earth began to be unleashed in the sixth chapter. They were evacuated when the shout, come up hither, was given. There are those who say that Revelation 4.1 is an exclusive picture of John the Beloved in a vision being caught away in the presence of God. Therefore, they reason this has nothing to do with anyone else, including the church. But this argument, is fa um, fa it fails because chapter 4, verse 10 states, the four and 20 elder elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. When will believers be crowned? Immediately after the rapture. Um, you want proof? Thou shalt be recompensed or rewarded at the resurrection of the just. Luke 14, 14. And again, and when the chief shepherd shall appear his coming, ye shall receive a crown of glory. 1 Peter 5, 4. Obviously, the judgment seat of Christ must take place before believers are crowned. Then they lay these crowns at Christ's feet in verse 10 and 11, meaning they are already in his presence. The only way they could have gotten there is through the coming up hither of verse 1. We must also remember that John, the, representat the representative of all God's people, is shown the things which must be hereafter and the things that will happen both in heaven and on earth. Chapters 4 and 5 picture that, with, um, picture that which takes place in heaven, while chapters 6 through 18 picture is a picture of that which occurs on the earth. Um, the tribulation. Verse 2. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Again, as in chapter 1, verse 10, the Holy Spirit takes complete control of John in order to give him the most glorious vision of in all time or eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ upon his throne. Most of us have not personally met many kings, queens, or presidents, but such introductions will become absolutely meaningless when we see Jesus in his majestic splendor. Praise God, that day will soon be here. We are going home imminently. Amen and amen. Verse 3. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. Here we see a comparison of Christ with two precious stones, the jasper and the sardine. The jasper is clear as crystal. 
chapter 21, verse 11, and is likened to the light of the holy Jerusalem, which comes from the glory of <coughs> from the glory of God. <coughs> chapter 21, um, verse 23. Imagine glory is that which first strikes our eyes as we see the Lord Jesus Christ. The sardine is red, the color of fire. This undoubtedly speaks of the righteous wrath of God and the judgment that is to fall in chapters 6 through 18. The rainbow resembling an emerald proves that the impending judgment will not come through a flood because of God's promise to Noah in Genesis 9, 13, but that it will be a holocaust of fire. After describing the throne and its occupant, John indicates the presence of another group situated in the very presence of the Lord. Verse 4, and round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. These are not angels, for elders always depict members of the human race. What members? <coughs> that would be the redeemed. They are also in resurrection bodies, as is the Lord, for they sit down. An immater um, immaterial spirit cannot sit. A material body is necessary in order to sit on a material throne. Christ possesses such a new glorified body. See Luke 24, 39. And when we see Jesus, we shall be like him. 1 John 3, 2. The elders are also clothed in white raiment. One could not put a coat on a spirit very readily, for it would continually fall to the floor. Haha. -ha. Um, the book of Revelation cannot be spiritualized. These are real people. In fact, since the judgment seat took place immediately after the come up hither of verse 1, these individuals are already wearing the crowns which they will place at the master's feet in verse 11. Who are these 24 elders? Some believe they represent the 24 groups or orders within the Levitical priesthood. This in turn represents all believers in Christ. For through him, as high priest, every Christian is a member of the royal priesthood. 1 Peter 2, 9. Others believe that the 24 elders represent the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles for a total of 24. In other words, they say that the elders represent God's people of all ages. This is a good possibility since Revelation 21 describes the new Jerusalem. The names of the 12 tribes inscribed on the gates and the names of the 12 apostles found upon the 12 foundations. See verses 12 through 14. Regardless of the view one holds, the four and 20 elders represent the children of God in the presence of the Lord before the horrible tribulation begins in chapter 6. A preview of the judgment was, um, a preview of the judgment about to be unleashed upon the entire globe is found in the following verse. Verse 5. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Lightning, thunder, and voices speak of judgment. Rumblings resound through the heavens as the saints are informed of what is about to occur on the earth. The present hour is so late, prophetically speaking, that this very scene could happen soon. We may, go, we may go home momentarily to become the very participants around the throne. Jesus is coming, and his appearance is at the door. See Matthew 24, 33. But wait, the seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God, picture the Holy Spirit in all his perfection. For seven always denotes flawlessness in the Bible. Note the seven characteristics of the Holy Spirit in Isaiah 11, verse 2. This blessed Holy Spirit is also involved in the impending judgment. Each member of the Trinity is righteously indignant over earth's inundation um, um, with wickedness and participates unitedly in the 21 seal, judgment, and bold judgments, which occur in chapters 6 through 18. Verse 6. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Although thunderous judgment will soon be released 
upon earth, perfect peace surrounds God's throne. The glassy sea pictures calmness, a sea untroubled by winds and storms. This is the church at rest in heaven before the storm occurs upon the earth. Hallelujah. Verse 7. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. Verse 8. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. These verses are very symbolic. Always take every word of the Bible literally, unless, um, unless God specifically indicates that it is figurative. In these texts, we find the words like a and as a, expressing symbolism. The term beast is zoon, Z-O-O-N, zoon. In the Greek, um, and it means a living creature. These are literal created beings. At this point, the symbolic and figurative expressions depict their strength and knowledge. Thus, they have eyes before and behind to see all things clearly and accurately. By comparing the characteristics of these living creatures with Isaiah 6, 1 through 3, we see they are undoubtedly seraphim, angels of God, created to praise, exalt, and adulate the Lord. These beings are not monstrosities. Instead, they are a picture of beauty. Within each species, there is always a leader, the lion among wild beasts, the calf among domestic animals, the eagle among birds, and man among all creatures. This is the portrait set before us. Angels in all their magnificence, praising the Lord, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Um, I took a second there, so, um, because I had to sneeze. Uh, but holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. This threefold adulation of holiness is for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the three in one. See 1 John 5, 7. The description, which was and is and is to come, is the title of the Father, chapter 1, verse 4, the Son, verse 5, and also the Holy Spirit, who always was and is and is to come. For the Trinity works unitedly. <coughs> the praising of God. <coughs> the Trinity works unitedly. The praising of God by these living creatures is contagious, and the entire group of God's people, pictured by the 24 elders, joins them. Verse 9, And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever. And verse 10, The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. This is one of the most glorious moments in heaven. The crowned saints lay their, lay their rewards at the feet of Jesus. They lay aside their rewarded glory to add to his glory, thereby ascribing all glory to him. They know that their victories came only because of his power working within them. The praise session is concluded with the words, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Imagine both the angels and the elders praise God for creating them. This proves there will be no evolutionists in heaven. Instead, they will join with Darwin in singing songs about their ancestors, the monkeys, in a place where the air conditioning does, air conditioning does not exist. Jesus is coming. Prepare. Be with the blessed host when the greatest praise festival in the entire universe and heaven occurs. 
Now, I should stop here. We've made it to chapter four, but chapter five isn't very long, and um, I have a few things to say about it. And here is an important statement to consider. Bible chapters and verses came into existence 500 years ago. They are not inspired, but greatly assist one in finding texts. Sometimes, however, they break the, continu um, the continuity of a study, such as the case at this point. Because John continues describing the heavenly scene, there should not have been a break between chapters 4 and 5. Verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. The book in the right hand of the Lord Jesus Christ is actually a scroll of either sheepskin, papyr papyrus, or vellum. Um, its subject is redemption, and it con it, it, its contents unlock the remainder of this chapter. The message is contained on the inside and the outside, and is enclosed by seven seals. Verse 2, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose, loose the seals thereof? The search for a member of the human race, past or present, or any rank of angel to open the book proves fruitless. None is worthy. Verse 3, And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look there, thereon. And so John is heartbroken. But verse 4 tells us, And I wept very, I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. John's lament has to do with the fact that this scroll is also the title deed to the earth. As long as it remains sealed, Satan will be in complete control of the planet. Verse 5, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. John's weeping ends <coughs> at the place where all tears are dried. He is pointed. He is pointed to Christ. Um, whose tears are turned to joy. Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. And since Judah is the leading tribe of Israel and a lion is the king of the beasts, Christ is thus pictured when he comes as Israel's king. See, ch see chapter 19, verse 16. It is at this same moment that the Lord God gave unto him the throne of his father David. Luke 1, 32. And let's go further in proving that our Savior is the one John sees. Verse 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. As I uh, mentioned previously, the seven-sealed scroll is the title deed to the earth, and its subject is redemption. The Lamb of God, John 1, 29, who earned the right by redemption to the title deed of the earth, is the only one worthy to open the seals. This is the Lamb who died for you and for me. Yes, Christ died for our sins. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. He shed his precious blood to purchase our redemption. For the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. 1 John 1, 7. John who recorded the fact that Jesus was the Lamb of God when he walked upon the earth, now says that no one can overcome but by the blood of the Lamb. Chapter 12, verse 11. Have you been to Jesus for that cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? There is no other way. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sins. See Hebrews 9, 22. This Lamb is worthy because of the sacrifice he paid for your sin and mine. Yes, worthy is the Lamb to be praised for time and eternity. The Lamb's seven horns picture strength. Jesus said, All authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Matthew 28, 18. The seven eyes pictured the fact that he sees everything each of us does. All things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Hebrews 4, 13. Since seven means perfection, there will be no mistakes made as the judgment is meted out, because the seven spirits of God, a picture of the Holy Spirit in all his fullness, rest upon Christ without measure, coupling his power, seven horns, 
his all-seeing vision, seven eyes, along with his filling of the Spirit of God in a sevenfold way. See Isaiah 11, 1, verse 2. Not one mistake will be made during the tribulation hour. The one found worthy acts now. Verse 7. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. The twenty-four elders, representatives of all God's saved people, share in this glorious moment. The praise is so spectacular that the redeemed break out in song. A, a, a beautiful heavenly choir, the largest ever assembled. Listen to them. Verse 9, And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Verse 10, And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Um, this song is in appreciation of the fact that Christ was slain on Calvary's cross, that his precious blood was shed, see 1 Peter 1, 19, and that it was shed for the entire world. This includes Pres um, Presbyterians, Lutherans, Methodists, Catholics, and Baptists. Some Christians think they are going to have their own little corner all alone in heaven, but that's not so. Christ's sacrifice was for all kindreds, all tongues, and all people, and all nations. God loves the world. The choir also sings about their soon return with him when he comes as the king of kings. Chapter um, 19, verse 11. At that time, they, the armies of heaven, will follow him upon white horses. At this point, the angels also join in praising the Lamb. Verse 11 and 12. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the beast and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Verse 12, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Notice that this passage is not a song. Nowhere does the Bible teach that angels sing. They recite their praise, whereas the church triumphant sings her glorious message. The angels associated with the Lord since their creation know him as few know him, for they have lived with him for thousands of years. They praise the Lamb for seven reasons. His power, his spiritual riches, his wisdom, his might, his honor, his glory, and his blessing. Carnal Christians who will not bow and worship to Christ here on earth soon will. Verse 13, And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him, be unto, be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. At this point, Philippians 2, 9 through 11 will be fulfilled. Wherefore God also hath high, highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What is the response as the heavenly hosts envision this future hour? Verse 14. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and, four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Notice they get a head start. They cannot wait to begin their worship of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's where we're going to stop. And I will see you in my next video where we begin chapter 6 through maybe 10. We'll see. Um, but I will be back and I the Lord willing, um, we could be raptured at any moment and I'm ready to go home. I hope you are too, because I want to see you in heaven. <laughs>